without further ado, Dr. Michael Crane. Well, thanks everyone for coming today. It's, uh, we're here at Florida Atlantic University in sunny uh, South Florida, and it's a great day to uh, be down here when, uh, in the wintertime. So today's topic is going to be business valuation, and what we're going to be talking about in uh, the course of uh, today's talk is talk about situations where business valuation is, is needed, and I'm going to talk to you about some of the projects that I've uh, worked on. So let's, uh, let's start right in. Um, we get a contract to do the work, either with the lawyer or with the lawyer's client. Uh, we are paid by the hour. My hourly rate is $425 per hour. I have staff there at a lower hourly rate, and we just basically do our job. And this took, um, I think it was over a year's year uh, of time, not continuously, uh, ebbs and flows. And, um, and we keep track of our time and uh, bill by the hour and send out our bills and, um, and hope it gets paid. So uh, that's, uh, that's how, how, how it works. So uh, that, that's one case. Let me, uh, uh, every one of these is different. So let me kind of uh, talk to you about in general how what, what I do in one of these types of projects. And they're not all litigation, but that's the glamorous thing and that's what people want to hear about is the, is the litigation because that's what they see on the TV with the law shows, right? So um, when I'm hired, uh, sort of the general framework is I want to see the what's called legal pleadings. Those are the initial uh, documents that the lawyers on each side have to file with the court in a certain prescribed format and I want to read the early ones and essentially what the um, plaintiff who's filing the lawsuit the lawyer files a pleading says this is what we're complaining about here's here's the facts or this is our version of the facts and uh, our claim is is that these a portion of the facts violate these laws and therefore we're going to have a lawsuit and we're going to seek damages, economic damages, because we claim that the, these facts are a violation of the law. Now the, that's filed with the court, that's called a complaint in, in civil uh, litigation. Now the lawyer on the other side has a certain amount of time to respond to that complaint and typically they will uh, admit or deny each one of the particular points in the original complaint and then they may offer defenses. So I want to go out and look at those pleadings so I can say he, uh, he or she says this and he or she says this and this is what they're fighting about. So that sort of gives me some background information in order to do the number crunching because it's always valuable to have some context to uh, know what you're uh, doing. So um, now that I've got background information, I know the scope of my work, I know why the parties are fighting, then I want to go out and collect data. Now, most of the data is going to come from uh, the party, or maybe there's two parties involved, and I want to get information uh, from the, the relevant parties. So most of my information comes in the form of documents, you know, sheets of paper that have been generated previously. That's uh, maybe business records, accounting records, uh, correspondence, emails, what have you. Uh, so a lot of the information I review is, is in printed form. Another kind of information I rely on is testimony, because along the line, uh, the lawyers have the right, and they do so. They, they subpoena an individual uh, uh, involved with the case to sit down to give a deposition. And if you're not familiar with that, essentially what happens, and this is in civil litigation, uh, the, if an individual is involved some way with this case, the, um, e either lawyer can subpoena, file a legal subpoena to that individual, and that individual has to appear to take his deposition. And what that involves is you come into a conference room, a uh, traditional conference room, and there'll be uh, um, the witness at the end of the chair, sometimes a television camera uh, at the end of the table just like this one, and uh, one lawyer will ask the witness questions, and besides 
being recorded on video, there'll be a court reporter off to the side uh, transcribing every single word that goes on inside that room. So um, whatever said, uh, sometimes I'm in the room listening, and sometimes I'm not there, and I'll get a copy of the printed transcript, which is the word for word of the question and answers. All of that will provide me with information. Now, why am I in the room sometimes? Sometimes the, uh, the witness is um, uh, financial oriented or has an important role with a financial orientation, and the lawyer doesn't have an accounting background or a financial background and needs some help questioning the witness. So I will sit off to the side of the lawyer and write questions, suggested questions on a little yellow piece of paper and, and hand it over here to the lawyer. And the lawyer sometimes says, great question, and he, and he or she asked it. And sometimes it's like, that's a stupid question from uh, the accountant over here. But uh, anyway, I'm there to help the, uh, the, the uh, lawyer uh, with uh, getting some more facts out of the witness. We intermingle the skills of a forensic accountant with the skills of a valuation expert and bring that to the table because many cases like the one I just talked about, and I'll talk about one or two more, uh, involve those kinds of skills, both the number crunching valuation and the forensic accounting to figure out, hey, there ought to be some documents about this. Let's go out and look at the documents or ask for the documents. That's uh, basically forensic accounting. Uh, I would like to also talk about that the skills that uh, I have learned and through my experience over the years are both in forensic accounting and valuation and um, in other areas uh, too. Um, and I've come across situations where I can accumulate all of those skills and bring them to bear to a particular problem. So I'd like to tell you about a couple of cases, and they're similar cases, so I'll lump these two together. Now, I can mention the names because it's in the public record and it's associated with me. These involve two different lawsuits. They're unrelated, involving Starbucks and Applebee's. So we have an online audience, so I'll tell you who they are in case uh, we have some folks from international not familiar with them. Uh, Starbucks is a very large coffee chain. Um, based in the United States, and they are also located in other countries, and their basic uh, operation is selling retail coffee and things that go along with that. And over the years, they've been relatively successful. The second company is Applebee's. Applebee's is a chain of rest family restaurants in the United States. I don't know if they're in Canada or anywhere else, but they're not as large of a chain as, as Starbucks. So. Uh, that's sort of uh, the, the parties involved. So what we've got are two different lawsuits unrelated to each other, but my work was very similar in both of them. And my work kind of uses forensic accounting and valuation and other skills that I have that, you know, that'll become obvious as I talk about what I did in these matters. So both of these cases involve class action lawsuits by current or former employees. What class action lawsuits mean instead of an, one employee filing a suit that there is a claim that the company did something systematically wrong involving, in this case, the employees, and instead of each employee having to go to the expense and having hundreds of separate lawsuits, the courts have a way to aggregate those when there's common causes, common causes by the offending party. Um, to put them all into one big lawsuit, and it has to go through a certification process by the court in order to say, yes, those two, uh, the, all of those employees are similar in standing, and we'll go ahead and aggregate those lawsuits into one, and that's called a class action lawsuit, where you have multiple plaintiffs against uh, typically a single defendant. So in this, these two lawsuits, you had current and former employees, and it was all about the wages that ought to have been paid under the federal wage laws. So one case, it was about um, uh, overtime hours, and in the other, it was about the minimum wage. So real quickly, the uh, one claim was we had managerial employees that didn't get paid overtime, that 
that claimed that part of their work, a significant amount of work, not incidental, was the same work that hourly employees did, but they didn't get paid overtime like the hourly employees did. So there's a claim that there's a legal violation, at least for the part of that part of the time that they were doing the same work that hourly employees were doing. So it's a claim for overtime pay. The other lawsuit uh, was a little bit different, still goes to federal wage laws. Um, real quickly, there's minimum wage laws that we're experienced with. That's the standard minimum wage law that says minimum wage is here, and that's your typical employee. For folks, employees that work in restaurants and bars and that sort of thing, part of their compensation is tips. When we go out to eat or you know, drink at a pub or whatever, we give tips. They're at a lower hourly rate. So there's a two-tier system in there. Uh, well, this particular lawsuit was some of the employees that were tipped employees, like food servers or bartenders, were doing their work and subject to that lower minimum wage uh, under the law. But uh, the claim was is they were asked by the store manager to some, sometimes don't do those functions, but go do something else, like work in the kitchen as needed, which is not a tipped position. Um, but the minimum wage was different. So uh, the, I don't want to get too much into the details, but it was a claim over the minimum, minimum wage based upon tipped employees and so forth. So that sort of sets up the background. Now, what did I have to do with this? So in civil litigation like this, it's about the money. So the plaintiffs, all these employees in each of the lawsuits were suing about money and the claim was is you didn't pay me what I was due under the law so we're going to go through this process and figure out what I'm due and then give me a check. So it proceeds in the litigation like I explained earlier, uh, lots of documents, uh, depositions and so on and so forth. In this case, I'm dealing with payroll records. Now, one of these cases, there's 5,000 employees in the class. So, and, and the company paid them weekly. So I've got a payroll record for 5,000 people for week one, payroll records for 5,000 people for week two, and go on, and this went on for four or five years. So I got lots and lots of payroll records and it's gross pay and federal withholding and so, you know, and all that. So all of this doesn't come in on paper anymore. It's all electronic. So I'll get either a CD or uh, an email with a big database file in there. And then I got to like say, well, okay, uh, how do I go about calculating this? So this is under the law. So I have to work with the lawyer and say, what's the claim? What's the law? You tell me the law, Mr. or Ms. Lawyer, you're the expert. And then I'm going to put in the financial parameters of what ought to have been paid and apply a formula to each one of those tens and hundreds of thousands of payroll records. Now, I didn't do that with a calculator on my desk. Um, I had to use a computer. And so what I ended up doing is I wrote a, a series of computer programs and where I would put in the sort of algorithm, so to speak, that incorporates the law. So I would have a computer program pull in the data from the payroll records, bring in the algorithm and do all the calculations and say, this is the shortfall for employee one for week one. This is the shortfall for employee two for week one and so forth and let the computer do all that work. And then I had to like aggregate that or let the computer program aggregate it so I can say, well, over all of these years for this particular employee, this particular employee is owed X dollars. So, uh, I did that by able to collect the data, work with the lawyer to understand the legal parameters in a financial sense, put it into a computer program, which I did, and then bring it all together and have to be very careful that I programmed it right. If I programmed it wrong, I could be hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars off one way or the so, other. What does it take to uh, do business valuation uh, and boil down uh, some knowledge, some specialized training, and some work experience and working in a shop and doing the actual work? Um, I, at, at the introduction, uh, I am an adjunct professor here at Florida Atlantic University in the School of Accounting. 
Uh, we have three business value or four value, business valuation courses. I think the only one um, like that, and uh, that's uh, one source of uh, education. And uh, that's, that's a way to uh, go about getting education in their specialty training and then, of course, the, the work experience. So if you want to see more of what I do, uh, you can check out my website and just see the kinds of things that I've worked on and the kinds of general uh, services. Uh, uh, the name of my firm is Financial Valuation Group. And the uh, web address is uh, FBG Frank Victor Golf. FL, franklima.com. So it's FBGFL.com, Frank Victor Golf, franklima.com. And if you just want to see what a business valuation specialist does, you can take a look at that and get a flavor for that. So that concludes uh, my prepared part of the talk. And I will be happy to uh, take any questions either here in the live audience or online. As an expert witness given this testimony under oath, um, do you put yourself at some legal liability yourself uh, that you could be sued based on what your testimony is? Um, uh, the question is, is uh, being an expert witness, is there any uh, legal risk for me uh, being sued like for malpractice, professional negligence? Uh, yes, just like any accountant or lawyer or doctor, uh, I potentially am um, exposed to being sued by a client or a former client that wasn't satisfied with what I did. Now, uh, in order to win that kind of suit, um, and I'm not going to get in all the gory details, but the way the professional negligence is, is the professional has had to deviate from the normal practices within that, that community of professionals, um, and the party needs to have been harmed. So uh, let me give you an example here, uh, medical profession. Somebody needs to go to the oncologist because of uh, the, the risk of having cancer or actually having cancer, and the patient doesn't like the diagnosis that they have cancer. Well, you're not going to sue the doctor for uh, diagnosing you with a disease that you actually have. So uh, taking that example and putting it over to what I do, if I say the value of a business is X and I've done my job and they don't like it, that doesn't mean I've given the bad diagnosis uh, or an improper diagnosis. As long as I looked at everything that I should have and applied the generally accepted methodologies that I should have as defined by my peer of professionals, I'm safe on that. Uh, usually, I'm per my, the way I work, I'm pretty thorough. I dot the I's and cross the T's, so I've never had uh, any problems like that, but others have. And um, oftentimes, that they have to pay a price, but it is a business risk that professionals of all sorts, accountants, lawyers, and doctors, and engineers have to, to face. That's a cost of doing business. Yes, I, I understand that there's a lot of designations out there for business valuation. I know there's the ASA. The ABV. Is the ABV part of the AICPA? Yes, the uh, certification ABV, Accredited in Business Valuation, is issued by the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants. At this point in time, with the public perception, uh, the public, uh, from the lawyers and judges all the way over to actual users, they don't put make so much distinction between this credential is better than this credential. If you got a certification in business valuation from one of the major organizations, I think that's good enough as from a public perception standpoint. And if you get multiple ones, well, great, but I don't think it helps you get any more work um, or losing work because you don't have a particular one. Uh, maybe a long time ago that was the case, but that's not the case now from my view. Any other questions online? Any questions online? Okay. All right. Well, I appreciate you coming to FAU today. I hope you enjoyed learning a little bit about business valuation and the intersection of that with forensic accounting and some of the things that I do and uh, some of the glamour and not so glamorous part of it. So uh, with that, we are adjourned for today, and I believe that we're going to uh, go down the hall and uh, have a little refreshments and maybe a little little lunch. So thanks for everybody coming today.